Should I stop? Okay. <laughs> okay. Margarita, Giselle, and the Queen. Margarita saw the Queen in that summer of 1901 when all the days were damp and filled with the smell of salt. She couldn't see the future through the fog, but she imagined machines, money, and motion. A city crammed with tenement houses and streetcars. She was 14 years old. She and her mother, Marie Julia, had just arrived in Ponta Delgada, having said goodbye forever to aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends, the living and the dead. They had their freshly issued passports and their trunks were still in the cart that had carried them the short distance from Rosario, Lagoa. Soon they would board the Donna Maria. But what was that commotion? They had forgotten all about it. Yes, Queen Amelia and King Carlos were visiting Ponta Delgada. And there was the queen right on the other side of a large group of cheering people. Margarita, who was coming quick, darted under elbows and between skirts to get a good look. The queen was tall and seemed kind. She smiled and waved at the crowd. I like to think that Margarita caught her eye, that she and the queen were poised for a moment on a pivot in time, and that they would remember the moment always, even as they traveled in opposite directions, one to the new world and one back to the old maelstrom of political intrigues. I know Margarita remembered. Before she married Carlos, Amelia had been a French princess, the great granddaughter of Louis Philippe, the citizen king. Louis Philippe had a long history of rolling with punches, starting with his years of exile when he earned a modest income teaching in a boys' school and later traveled the world incognito. Amelia must have inherited her great grandfather's talent for coping for coping with sudden change, as she would demonstrate in 1908. As the royal family crossed the Terrera de Paso in an open carriage, a couple of assassins shot and killed the king and his older son, Crown Prince Louis Philippe. But when a third shot hit the younger son, Prince Manuel, in the arm, Queen Amelia turned and whacked the gunman with the huge bouquet she had just been given, catching him off guard and saving Manuel's life. Those were big punches. Amelia ordered some black dresses from her dressmakers. Margarita went to the school for immigrants. She learned to say, I see the cat, I see the dog, but wondered where that was going to get her. Not very far, she decided, and she didn't go back. She met Shazza at a dance. He was good looking and she was slim and quick. Where else but in New Bedford could a girl from Rosario Lagoa meet a boy from Riberina Ribera Grande? They married on April 1st, 1905, and in no time at all, they became Margaret and Joseph, although at home they still used the old names. Joseph was a fireman. He worked in the cotton mills, not putting out fires, but keeping them going. He also kept a, green, a dream going, a dream of becoming a citizen of the United States. He practiced writing his name, Joseph Vieira, over and over again on scraps of paper. His handwriting was shaky. Joseph and Vieira were the only words he knew how to write. The courtroom was so full of hope that Joseph could hardly breathe. Soon he would raise his hand and take the oath of citizenship. At least that's what he thought but he had some punches to roll with too. There in the courtroom, Joseph had a stroke, his first, and wasn't able to take the oath. Afterwards, he had to walk with a cane. He never became a citizen. Years later, on a summer morning in 1941, Joseph went into the bathroom to shave and get ready for the day. His second stroke was as sudden as an assassin's bullet. He died on the 4th of July. If Margaret had had a bouquet of flowers, she would have wanted to whack someone with it, but there really wasn't anyone to whack. So she bought some black dresses and a black, a black coat and a black hat. What else could she do? And now 
Thank you. Moving on to Vavor Kadalata. Um, my Vavor Kadalata was my grandfather's third wife. He first, first he married her cousin and they, and they had, um, well, his first wife died giving birth to twins and the twins died too. So then he married my grandmother's sister and they had two children. And while the children were still pretty much babies, she died. And um, my grandfather was not having very luck with wives and marriages and children. So he started talking about taking his children back to a reef where he was from. Um, and they had been living in Sarok, which is not all that far from a reef, but it was, it was farther in those days than it is now. And my great grandmother would hear none of that. He wasn't gonna take her grandchildren to, to a reef. So she said, I'll give you Carlotta if you'll stay here and, and raise the children here. And so my grandmother was pretty much forced by her mother to marry my grandfather. Um, it was an arranged marriage, unlike my other grandmother who married for love. Um, and I always wondered how she felt marrying her sister's widower. And I wrote a poem about it. Carlotta wears her sister's life like skin. Carlotta wears her sister's life like skin, a snug imprisonment. She wanted less surety, wanted not to be moon servant to a planet on its boisterous orbit. But Maria Conceição's children were easy, their faces bowls to be filled. And so once the dispensation has been grand, had been granted, she married him, her sister's widower, brother by affinity, but not by consanguinity. He was at least good looking. She was young, she did her job. She made the soup. When the babies came, she fed them. He was always off driving his mules or singing in those silly contests. She was the one they circled, holding up fingers to be bandaged, confiding fears and dreams. She scrubbed the purple stains of fear, but dreams make a soft shimmy, blank as milk. So she curdled milk ladled it into molds and drained away and waited. In the morning, they had fresh cheese with their breakfast bread. These are your dreams, she said. If you eat your dreams, you will live your dreams. What did they know? They thought she was the earth because she was the mother. That was when she knew her sister's life had flaked and peeled away. Her arms were tanned and strong and she was hungry. She sprinkled sea salt on the surface of her piece of cheese and she ate it with a knife. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, magnificent, and what a, what a lovely way to, um, to remember uh, your avosh, both, both sides. Fantastic. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for your talent. Um, thank you for your poetry. And um, we are going to turn now to, um, so we'll, come, we'll go from the East Coast to the West Coast and uh, Sam Pereira. You hear me now? We sure can now, Sam. Sorry about that. It's okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to read um, three poems. The first one is from my grandfather, who I actually never met. He died in 1945, um, and uh, I was born in 1949. So when I wrote the first book, and it was published in 1978, uh, called The Marriage of the Portuguese. There's a poem in it for him, and the poem is called Fado. Uh, I've since changed the title to Fado for Cipriano because I've written other poems called Fado since then. Uh, I made a terrible mistake when I wrote the poem. 
And I'm here to apologize to my Avu somewhere, wherever he is, because in the book I spelled his name wrong. Uh, his name was Cipriano, and I spelled it with a C. And uh, it's S Y P R I A N O. Mea culpa. Thought over Cipriano. He came to the United States just before the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. Um, this is called Fado for Cipriano. Cipriano in a fog of dead animals, 1905 and the quake building. A woman praying for you in Tuseda the skin of that woman's hands white at the tips. In those days, answers. In these, death. A song and a moment's notice. That girl I took easily for quarters and the right tune. Then failure in an open bedroom. The earthquake that never returned. No medicine, Cipriana. And were you there as she lathered my back with black soap? The grease on a poor man's bones. Tragedy. And we do carry on. But were you in the neighborhood? These days, the lack of color in the neighborhood's eyes. The quake, a lie. In a fog of dead animals, I stalked for the night with wine glasses and phonograph records from the islands. You're invited, Cipriano. Bring your wife. We'll dance and speak in the old language. You can tell me I'm wrong to go on this way. A slap or a belt or a yank on this wire hair. A kiss that would bring me to tears. Evaporation and fog. In 2012, there was a, um, an expanded edition of that first book that was published by Tagus Press. And uh, it included some additional poems that weren't part of the, uh, the first edition. The last poem in that book is, um, a poem from my grandmother, my Va, who used to make these incredibly hard cookies. I mean, they, they would take teeth out if you weren't careful. And she did it deliberately. I mean, it was, uh, it was something to kind of gnaw on, like, uh, I suppose, um, a teething ring or something like that. I watched her make them, and they included a lot of sugar as one might expect. So the poem is called The Sugars of Terceda. Let's say I could understand every word she said. I couldn't. The translation was laid out in black beads. That took the story just so far. Before rebellion kicked in, I loved her for the hard cookies we all referred to as bulls. She made them because they pleased us, filled with fresh butter and what seemed cups of sugar. They'd required genuine gnawing worth uh, um, to get through. 
any dentist worth his salt would say these things showed at the very least a lack of caution. I hate dentists for their certainty. I loved her. She knew before she we'd figure it out. Sweetness was a lie in any language. Then she'd smile and give them to us anyway. Is everybody hearing me okay? Because I, I got a little interference there, I thought. Perfect, perfect, Sam. Thank you. There was a bit. Last, the last one I wanna read is a more recent poem. And um, it too is for my grandmother. Her name was Carolina Pereira. It's called For Ava in Prayer to the Wind. Those earlier poems were written by a much younger man. These are written by somebody who's uh, been a little bit more seasoned, let's say. But I'm still talking to my grandmother. If I had it to do over, Carolina, I would have done it just the same. When I wrote about your rosary and your intrepid belief in the sustainable air of heaven, I was doing my best to walk away intact, to binge on the draw of rock and roll. When I took in paradise through a straw and watched myself dissolve on the coffee table glass, I was 21 and you had gone to the ether five years before. In the aftermath of old terrors, a caricature of you graced the cover of the first book I shook in the direction of the stars. It showed a woman pondering an ocean. I'm sorry, pondering the distance and glancing at what people can only assume an ocean, holding on and letting go. The foolish boy gone missing, lost to the soup of old religions and the tempting amenities of love. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Sam has a new book out called The True North and Untrue You. You can buy it wherever you buy your books. Um, and um, he has also been uh, publishing um, uh, I mean, he's also been publishing, you might call it that, on, on, uh, on Facebook. You can always count early morning to turn on Facebook, as I do. And it is a treat when we have a, poet, a poem from Sam. He, he, he uh, shares it with everyone. And then, of course, he works it a little bit more and everything else. But it's just, a, and lately he's been writing lots and lots about his Portuguese Azorian heritage. Um, again, thank you so much, Sam. And from Sam Pereira, we will turn to uh, Melissa Jensen Heiser. Uh, so I'll skip over a couple of generations and go to Melissa Jensen Heiser, uh, who is uh, a uh, uh, who is a graduate from the MFA program at Fresno State and works at the university as well. Melissa, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, to me, as you're always so gracious to include me, and it has helped me re-engage with my cultural heritage in a new way and it's been really lovely um, so thank you everyone i love hearing everyone's work um, i'm reading some excerpts today from a much longer essay called in the beginning um, which is largely about memory and um, is centered around my grandmother mary who was my maternal grandmother and her parents immigrated to america from san miguel um, and um, I also write about uh, her second husband, my grandfather, 
um, he's not my biological grandfather, but I knew him as my grandfather. And they both loved going to the coast. It's very common for a lot of uh, Portuguese American folks in California to vacation on the central coast. And so um, their favorite place was Morro Bay. And um, after my grandfather died, my my grandmother started taking painting lessons and she was this incredible painter. Um, and a lot of her paintings featured the water. Um, so water is also a common theme here. Okay. I heard we came from water, tiny cells that multiplied and evolved into fish that can breathe in the depths. And I heard of one fish that can hibernate in droughts and awaken when the waters return survive with or without it. I heard this fish is our ancestor, proof we began in the oceans, this fish that can breathe dust. I heard we came from water, and to water we will return. In the dream, I kneel in sand, the sound of water lapping against the shore in tiny but not insignificant waves. A body in shadow stands next to me, its hands extending over my head, tipping a container. I look up in time to see grandma's ashes drop in a gray, dusty cloud onto my face. I open my mouth and consume them. Grandpa died when I was in the sixth grade. We took his ashes to Morro Bay, a sleepy coastal town in California, his wish. He wanted them to be spread at sea. Grandma chartered a boat and a small crowd of mourners gathered to send grandpa to his final resting place. I watched as grandma emptied his urn into the sea. I noticed how his ashes rested on top of the water. For a moment, he was still whole before they slipped beneath the waves. I imagined pieces of him floated out to distant places swept along by currents carried on the backs of sea creatures, swirled along in the wakes of great ships. Parts of, him, parts of him made it to corners both distant and remote. He swam through the warm waters of the Pacific, the frigid temperatures of the Arctic. He lazily coasted through small lagoons. Some of him evaporated to the sky where it joined with other precipitous elements and returned to the earth in flat globules of fresh rain then join the rushing waters of melting mountain snow. After his travels concluded, after he explored every earthly waterway, every oceanic zone, his pieces reunited in the deepest part of the ocean. In the darkness and pressure at the bottom of the world, he reformed and rose again, a god of the sea. In heavy bursts, he thrust upwards and outwards, one with the currents, which he rode back to California. My grandparents loved to vacation in Morro Bay. Sometime in the early 80s, they bought a camping trailer and several times throughout the year, they'd hook it up to grandpa's truck and haul it two and a half hours out of the palpable valley heat of Fresno to the foggy ocean town. On occasion, they brought my sisters and me with them. I've seen pictures of such trips we three girls nearly interchangeable with our brown pigtailed hair and tan skin. We loved playing on the beach. We'd splash into the water, paying little mind to the cold temperatures and swirls of stinky seaweed, jumping over waves and thrusting our small hands into the sand. Feeling around until we clasped onto a seashell, we'd raise our prize high overhead and yell out a number, 15, I've got 15 now and race back to grandma resting on blankets in the sand, eager to celebrate our triumphs. Grandpa would be waiting for us back at the trailer, lounging in a lawn chair, the newspaper open on his lap, his long legs stretched out before him. Grandma would make us rinse off all the sand in the campsite shower before climbing into the trailer where we'd unpack our findings and hover over them. We'd compare our treasures. Mostly we found broken muscles, dark blue and still rough from sand and seawater, or snapped sand dollars round and gray with jagged edges where a rock or careless foot broke through their delicate centers. 
We'd sit in jealousy if one sister found a whole sand dollar, a rarity that felt miraculous. Once my oldest sister's haul yielded a clam. Grandpa took it from her and held it lightly in his hand. Smiling a wry grin, he reached into his jacket and produced a pocket knife. He stuck the knife into a small crevice in the shell and thrust it open. Our eyes grew to moon-sized disks when he dumped the slimy contents of the shell into his mouth and swallowed it whole. Ew, we squealed and hopped around on our tippy toes, our noses wrinkled in disgust. In the sixth grade, when a few months after grandpa died, grandma took me to Morro Bay, just the two of us. I welcomed the singular attention, so used to sharing it with my older sisters and younger cousins. We stayed at Motel 6 right off the freeway. In our room, I marveled over the miniature soaps and bottles of shampoo in the bathroom. There was a TV and grandma let me watch it until I fell asleep. One night, she even let me eat ice cream for dinner. At the end of our trip, we drove out to Morro Rock, an ancient volcanic plug that juts out of the ocean just offshore. Along its south side, huge rocks and boulders quarried from the great rock itself form the man-made breakers that ease the ocean water heading towards the docks. Back then, one could still climb around on the breakers, though there were signs that warned of the dangers. Grandma and I took a bouquet of flowers with us and carefully climbed our way onto the breakers as far as we would dare, where we tossed the flowers into the ocean. We threw them against the wind and they tumbled onto the rocks just ahead of us, only to be picked up by sweeping waves and carried deeper into the sea towards where we'd buried Grandpa. We watched in silence as the last of our offering was carried away by the water the waves grew larger with the coming tide, nudging us to turn around and head back to the safety of the parking lot. I leapt ahead of grandma, hopping from boulder to boulder when I heard her cry out. I turned in time to see her slip and fall to her knees, her hands scraping along the salty rocks. I hurried to her side. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine, she said breathlessly. It was Bert, he was trying to keep me. We laughed at her joke and I helped her stand up. I walked ahead of her slowly, testing each rock before stepping, assuring her that if she followed in my steps, she'd be okay. Every few steps, I turned back toward the ocean, searching the waves for a familiar hand. Maybe I saw it. Maybe I saw grandpa's new form, all seven feet of his human heft shifted into spinning whirls of water. I imagined him lifting above the spray, reaching for his love, calling her home. Grandma died on the first day of February, 90 or so years earlier on that same day Grandpa was born. Per her wishes, my mom and aunt had her cremated. This time we charter no boat, but stand on the water's edge and watch as Grandma's daughters wade in and pour her into the frothy tide. They give us flowers to toss into the waves, which dance back towards us. And my cousin's young daughter splashes into the water, grabbing the flowers one by one, launching them back towards the sea. I curve into my husband's embrace, my shoulders crumbling with grief, quiet sobs escaping my throat. I hide my face in his chest. I do not want to see it happen to watch as the remnants of grandma's body slip away among the waves, to know that grandpa has surfaced from the depths of the ocean and finally called her. Wow. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. Got to stop uh, making me cry when you read. Um, thank you, Melissa. And uh, for Melissa, we're going to um, uh, uh, stay here in California and go to a poet laureate, and that is Lada Goulart, who's a poet laureate for El Dorado County. And uh, thanks, Laura, uh, Laura, Laura. I was going to say Laura. Thanks, Laura, for so much for taking time. I know she just finished one uh, session and is coming on this one. Lada Goulart. Hello. Um, thank you, Dinesh. I really appreciate being here. 
And um, I want you to take note of my background, which kind of bring tears to my eyes. My cousin, John Cardosa, sent this to me. It's, it's uh, the uh, ranch of my great grandmother and grandfather from Pico. Uh, and it's still standing as you see it. Uh, I, as a young girl, used to spend time there. Not enough of it, I think. But um, the fact that this picture uh, he sent me and it's still there just brings tears to my eyes. So with that, um, I will explain that I am from um, my, my father's side of the family is from Fial, Santa Clara Valley. And, and I have so many grandparent stories. And some of the poets here have already heard my poetry about my grandparents, which they're going to hear again. Uh, I'm, read, I'm only reading three, but I'm going to spend the time on my maternal side of the family. Um, and my maternal side of the family is from um, Santa Cruz das Roberas in Pico. Uh, I think that I might have uh, in the same area, perhaps, I, I believe Elaine Avella's family, some of her family are from. And it goes back to the fact that when I was, I, I was blessed to be the oldest granddaughter, oldest grandchild in the family. Uh, so there was no children to play with. And, and I had the good fortune to grow up in part with my great grandmother who spoke no English, who came here as a male order bride during the gold rush, by the way. And this is her uh, ranch. And I lived with my grandmother and my great grandmother and my grandfather. And it was probably the, the most dearest time in my life. And, and I, I, you know, some people can't remember their early years. I really can. I think I remember my first seven years more than uh, if you asked me what I did in 1972, I couldn't tell you. So, but it, it comes out vividly. And, and my great grandmother and my grandmother who loved the land and would take me outside in her garden and literally plant me in the earth uh, where I would be watching her and hearing the birds and these memories just uh, I go back to as I get older and I'm getting quite a bit older now and those are just times that are precious to me now. So let me go with my poem and this is my great great grandmother who my great grandmother through the translation of my grandmother would tell me stories of because you see my great grandmother uh, Miss Pico, missed her home. All her life, she died when she was 95 and she cried. And she remembered her, her brother who, they were whalers who, who died on, on a whaling fishing trip and she would talk about it. And, and this is, and she would talk about her mother who was my great, great grandmother. And, and this is at the village, the poem is at the village of Santa Cruz Island of Pico looking for my great, great grandmother, Maria Francesca de Cabral. My fingernails scraped lava stones, loosened dust. Looking for the other world, I found a fissure in the earth that led to where the sea tossed its wet creatures, their lungs exhaling. The ocean spread dark and cold beneath the night, reached with every wave for drops of lights shed by the moon. Musty air in the ghost rattle through banana leaves, you rose up, bones of family architecture, luminous. A woman without soil, you carved roots from stones of the island. Into the Azorian sea you dove, the splash of your body and I jumped, scattering stars to pull toward you. Where ocean and sky met, you vanished. Your memory, the afterlife, dissolving all that salt, seeped back into the sea, an ocean mist without end. I held my breath, heard the heartbeat of waves, felt the ocean of my blood. My body took pleasure in forgetting gravity, the need for breathing on my own. I asked God to throw me a line, 
floating to the shore, I felt the pull of the universe slow everything down as heaven pulled the earth into its arms. So for her daughter, my great-grandmother, Maria uh, Cabral Nevish, who came to California as a mail order bride and who I got to know a little bit uh, when she was very old and I was very young, my poem, California Bride, and uh, behind in the background is her, it's called the Nevish Rats and that's where she lived. Bones half grown, she rises from a ship's dark hold, gives herself up to a hard-handed miner, grows thin from miscarriage, fat from pregnancy, sings songs in Portuguese as she hurries from cabin to sluice box on small calloused feet. I remember the old woman, not the girl, a widow in black with thick stockings, heavy shoes, lived in the corner of my grandmother's kitchen, gluing broken dishes. Always moving and praying, boiled her own egg till the day she died. The face of Maria Nevish, I wear her eyes, speak in her voice. She is waving her hands, reshaping the air to tell me in broken English that life is no sugar. My grand great grandfather was Manuel Neves, and um, he I never got to meet him. He passed away before you know, she, she lived on, and, and she I know that she missed him, uh, but I never got to meet him. Uh, and my other grandfather, this poem is about when he passed away, and I did know him and spent time with him because. For me, my grandparents were everything. Uh, I, I still, I, <laughs> I'm getting a little tearful here. Anyway, here, here's my grandfather. You go during one winter, the years have flattened your grave with the earth, wind wiped your name from the granite stone. You had woods and weather, rising bluffs and arching sky, mountains that lift clear to the ocean. The apple orchard you set on the green hill, sons and daughters all born in your old mountain home. You worked year after year, plowing back and forth with your shaggy maned horse, clans of birds, tribes of beasts in the forest. I can see you working cattle since daybreak, then home by now, nightfall for supper and sleep. No tree or stone or fence the same since you left. The brown barn leans like an animal. The apples are small and bitter. Hungry deer straggle and leaving bits of hide on barbed wire. I remember your promise of a hike in the woods, a swim in the pond, the trout we might catch. In dreams, you tell me to rake the dead stalks, clean the air, the earth bare again, scatter the wild grass. Thank you. Fantastic as always. Thank you, Lada. Thank you so much. And for those of you um, that heard one of the poems, this line, Into the Azorian Sea, I'm not plagiarizing uh, Lada. I've already asked her permission to use it as a title of the next anthology of Azorian poets translated to uh, from Portuguese to English and from English to Portuguese. So it'll be an anthology that shows that Azorian is, in, is not something only to the nine islands. It is something lived in Canada and the United States. And so I think so far I have 68 poets and counting. Uh, probably end up with a little over 75 or so. Um, the majority of them are, of course, translated from Portuguese to English, but there are, I believe, 
17 from English to Portuguese uh, with two poems each and the uh, title will be uh, and what credit will be due will be given obviously into the Azorian Sea. I love that line. Thanks to Lara for allowing me to use it. And so uh, from now from Lara we will go back to the East Coast and Scott Edward Anderson uh, who um, is uh, also a very prolific poet and writer, translators, uh, working on a major translation of Cursario de Zidish from Vitorin Nemesio. Pleasure having him, as always, Scott. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Denise. Um, I am going to do something a little bit different today and not read poetry. I'm going to read, um, I'd like to read an excerpt from my work in progress, which is a nonfiction uh, memoir uh, about uncovering my ancestral roots on the Azores. Uh, it's called The Others in Me, A Journey to Discover Ancestry, Identity, and Lost Heritage. And this is a chapter um, that speaks directly about my, my grandfather, who um, was born of, of um, immigrants from the Azores who came as teenagers in 1906 and settled in Fox Point, um, in Providence, Rhode Island. And this the ch chapter is called, Wow, That Baby Can Climb, which you'll, you'll see at the end. And I'll try, um, I'm gonna try to keep this as concise as possible. So I may have to skip over a little bit of it if we start to run out of time. Um, just, uh, yeah, I'll just start right in. Don't believe anything Aunt Alice tells you, my mother warned as I entered the living room of what was once my Portuguese grandfather's house, where my mother's aunt Alice sat on one of the upholstered chairs sipping tea. When I was a kid, the living room of my grandparents' house in East Providence was strictly off limits. Light paneled walls, ornate, almost Baroque furniture, an antique fold top secretary desk in the corner, knickknacks and ashtrays on all surfaces. While there was no plastic on the sofa or chairs, I don't recall anyone ever sitting on them, or if they did, it was only select adults after a Sunday dinner or a holiday meal, as we kids were sent outside to play or into the den to watch TV. A petite woman of 76, smartly dressed in a navy blue dress, hair recently styled in a manner suitable to a woman of her age and time, Alice Amaral, was the second child born to my great-grandparents, Jose and Anna Rodriguez Kishkiu, immigrants from San Miguel. Born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1917, it was now 1994 and the wake of her elder brother following his funeral that morning and burial at the Gate of Her Heaven Cemetery. I was eager to know about my Portuguese family's history and Alice was one of the last living links to their story. Do you know the story of how your grandparents got together? She asked. I shook my head no. Eddie was sweet on Marjorie's sister, Dorothy, Alice said, but Dottie didn't want to have anything to do with him. So she took up with Mar so he took up with Marjorie. She shifted in her chair, straightened the skirt of her dark blue dress against dark stockings, crossed her feet and leather pumps at the ankles. Later, Marjorie got pregnant. I remember Mama shouting at Eddie, Vergonia, now you gotta marry the girl. Oh my, what a scandal. They lost the baby after they got married. I loosened my tie, unbuttoned the buttons of my blazer, getting more comfortable. These were the kind of details I was after. Don't tell stories out of school, Alice, came a voice from the entrance of the living room. It was Alice's brother, Raymond, three years her junior, junior a short stocky figure in a dark suit holding a tumbler with ice and clear amber liquor. I'm not telling stories out of school, Alice fired back. In the kitchen, aluminum trays of food waited on the table, little sterno warmers set underneath with their slightly toxic oily smell mingling with the scents of food. Linguisa and chorizo sausages with onions and a light tomato sauce, macaroni and cheese, slices of roast beef au jus, Portuguese sweet bread and chunks of Italian bread with garlic butter. Cans of Narragansett beer nestled nearby in a cooler on ice alongside bottles of Mateus Rosé. Hi, neighbor, read the back of the cans of Narragansett. It was the can of beer that Captain Quint crushed in the movie Jaws, my Portuguese grandfather's beer. At the burial, two soldiers in dress blues folded the American flag that had draped over the casket. The crisp January air offered a hint of snow. 
Dirt hit the casket with a metallic thud. They buried my grandfather in the Cadillac of caskets, the highest end available from the Rubello funeral parlor. It was appropriate. He loved his Cadillacs at Vandevilles, which the New England Mutual Life Insurance Company, where he worked as a kind of celebrity underwriter, provided for him. The caddy I remember most was from 1972. Laura may remember that. A kind of beige or taupe with burgundy red interior. Willow, the official name of the exterior color, I looked it up, which DuPont produced exclusively for Cadillac. Dulux, registered trademark, code 5431D. That car looked like a body, tan on the outside, blood red on the inside, oozing status and success. Just four months earlier, we gathered in the same house to celebrate my Portuguese grandfather's 78th birthday. He was ailing and my mother and her sister, my aunt Pat, suspected they, he wouldn't make it to his 80th. I had recently rediscovered my Portuguese roots and had been studying the language, trying to learn it. My grandfather had built a bungalow on the back end of the property and moved in there a few years before, while my aunt Pat and her two children, my younger cousins, moved into her childhood home. I arrived early for the party and went over to my grandfather's house, knocking on the door. He opened it, looking a bit frailer than the last time I'd seen him. Hola, avô, I said to him in Portuguese. Hello, grandfather. Estou emprendendo português, I added, broken. I am trying to learn Portuguese. He stared at me, surprised. My grandfather only spoke Portuguese with his parents never taught it to my mother or her siblings. And as far as I knew, I was the only person of my generation in the family to try to learn the language or have any interest. He reached up and put his hand on my shoulder, brought me down to his level and put his mouth close to my ear, whispering in his gravelly baritone, do you know what that means to me? The house reeked of cigarette smoke, reminding me of my childhood visits to his home. There he would sit in his burgundy high-backed leather chair, in the den, what was it about him and that color red? A porcelain Rhode Island Golf Association ashtray on the side table next to him with its anchor crest bearing the state motto, hope, obscured by the ashes and butts. Surrounding him on every wall were shelves upon shelves of his golfing trophies and awards, framed photographs of my grandfather with young Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas, another of him as part of a foursome with two other club members and Sammy Davis Jr. Later at the party at his old house, he pulled me over to his brother, Raymond. Look at him, my grandfather said. Doesn't he look Portuguese? He looks like one of us. He was beaming with pride. I blushed and felt, felt my heart swell. Unfortunately, this moment of simpatico with his grandson didn't translate into action. While he had promised to reveal the family history to his daughter, he didn't follow through. Patty told me later that when she tried to sit him down, he said grumpily, why does he want to know these stories? It's my life, not his. He died just a few months later, taking the family history with him. Although born to an Azorian Portuguese immigrant couple in 1915 and growing up in Portuguese neighborhoods, Edward Perry, born Edward Cusquiu, did not want to be a Portuguese American. He was part of that generation that wanted to assimilate, wanted to be American. To him, being Portuguese meant looking backward, not forward to the future, and he was all about looking forward. His father, Jose, worked as a bricklayer in the Narragansett Electric Company's South Street Station project, built in two major phases during his prime working years. In 1925, the Kishkiyus moved across the Seekonk River from Fox Point to the newly expanding Watchmoket neighborhood of East Providence. Jose built their house at 85 Lyon Avenue, a two-family home that housed my great-grandparents and my great aunt Alice and her family, and later her brother Raymond and his family in the late 50s and early 60s. Farmland belonging to the Kent family to the east of Wachamoket would later be subdivided to become the Kent Heights neighborhood, where I spent some of my earliest childhood years in the 1960s, and where my maternal grandparents both lived until they, they died. In 1923, my great grandfather applied to become a naturalized US citizen. A clerk typing out the application butchered the surname Kashkilia. And with that, Jose, now Joseph, renounced his ties with Portugal, pledging allegiance to his adopted company, com country. At the time, Americanization was the ideal, prompting groups such as the Portuguese American Civic Society to advocate, if you want to be a good Portuguese, become an American. By the time of the 1940 US Census, the Kashkiyus officially changed their surname to Perry. 
1941, my grandfather joined the National Guard. That June, while stationed at Camp Landing, Florida, he married my grandmother, Marjorie Agnes Burgess, who came from a family that had settled in Sandwich on the Cape in 1637. In old photographs I have of the couple from this time, they resemble a young Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball. He with his swarthy good looks, rakish smile and black pompadour, she with her auburn hair and slim athletic body. My grandmother's slim figure from the photos taken around the time of their wedding and immediately before and after contradicts my great aunt Alice's tale of a shotgun wedding. Then came the war. My grandfather joined the Army Air Force in 19, uh, 19 September, uh, 1942, just five days after the couple's firstborn, my mother, Jean Carroll Perry, arrived. Entering as a private, he rose to the rank of Colonel by the time he finished duty on the 31st of March, 1945. In 1971, my grandfather received the Frank Lanning Award for the most outstanding contributions to sports in Rhode Island. I've skipped over a whole section where I talk about his golfing uh, life, a tribute that also appeared on the sports pages of the Providence Journal. In the award drawn by the illustrator and cartoonist Frank Lanning, rendering highlights from Ed Perry's life in cartoon style surrounding a handsome central portrait, one cartoon depicts my grandfather's fighter plane rising on an almost vertical line skyward, while two Army Air Force zoomies stand below admiring his ascent. One of them saying to the other, wow, that baby can climb. Thank you. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you for, for sharing that uh, with us. Um, Scott Edward Ederson. And um, from Scott, we're going to Elaine Avila, uh, coming to us from uh, the West Coast, uh, but uh, north of California from the beautiful area of British Columbia. Elaine, um, many of you know, and she actually had um, sent me a few poems that I've been working on, one of them, <laughs> Grandma's Embroidery that I love so much. Pleasure to have you here. Welcome, uh, Elaine. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you everyone on the panel. It's such an honor to be reading with all of you, and it's so wonderful to see Manuela Marujo. I love the your gallery of Portuguese pioneers so much, and Rosa Simas, who I interviewed um, during the pandemic. Um, I'm going to read uh, from both a few poems, and I'm going to sneak in some theater. As many of you know, I've been working on a play about the Capello e Capot, <laughs> um, these are capes that women in the Azores used to wear for about 400, 500 years, and they've become a symbol for the Azores Islands. I was drawn to work on the piece because of Islamophobia in Vancouver. Women are being stripped of the burqa at the airport and on the sky train and being attacked for covering, but also women around the world are protesting the rollback of women's rights by dressing like the handmaid's tale so i really wanted to know the stories behind the capes so i've been interviewing women um, and men during the pandemic and during my fulbright and so i'm going to share a little bit of that um, this piece is uh, from interviewing victor doors uh, who's a wonderful uh wonderful radio host and historian and theater theater director and actor uh, he shared this with me, and I have a sort of a content warning. It has a, a lot of violence in it. So, Vitor, my favorite story about the capote? It's an old one. I heard it all the time as a boy. Era uma vez, a young woman sneaks out in her capote. Why? To see her boyfriend. Her father, he's a harpoonist, you know, a harpoon. See, it's like this. Her father finds out that his daughter and her boyfriend, what they've been up to, and he stabs them both to death. That's a traditional story that I heard as a boy. So that's Victor's story. And then this is um, inspired by my grandmother. Uh, once I started working on the play, I didn't remember her ever embroidering capotes, but I had a dream that she was going to send me a present. She said, I'm going to send you a present. I don't know what to get you because you're so fancy, she said. And then uh, I got a box from my family who had sold her house and it had embroidery of the capotes, um, which I had the great fortune to bring to the Azores and have read for me by um, Christina Bors. So this is a, a, po uh, a little um, 
monologue from my grandmother. California, 1973. Helena enters with an embroidery of capots. My sisters and I, we make un bordado, the embroidery. We learn the stitches, an alphabet you can use. Querida, I will show you. You not just receive clothes, you can make them. You not just receive stories, you can tell them. Here, see? Stitch one, ponto lanzado, best for hortensias. In America, you call them hydrangeas. Diving into fabric like harpoonists. Step, stitch two, ponto de no, for the smallest flowers, making knots like fishermen. Stitch three, ponto pé de flor, the foot of a flower, we call them stems in America. Stitch five, ponto conotilio for height, or for when you want what you make to rise up and become real. Stitch six, ponto de recort for the edges to make the end beautiful. My sisters and I, we make the embroidery, we learn the stitches because we dream one day we will be married ladies and go visit each other and continue with our converses, cape to cape, cape to cape, cape to cape but this never came to pass. Instead, the days with my sisters and I became the beautiful days that would never return because now I am American and my sisters, we never set eyes on each other again. Instead, my sisters and I will mail our bordado to each other and I will read their deepest stories with my fingers. So thank you. Now I'm gonna read uh, two poems that I wrote for my grandparents. This one's from my grandfather who used to sit and tell me his stories. Um, he was one of the first photographers in his village in the village Laro was reading about Riberej. Avocados. In America, time is money. In Kenya, time is relationship. We look at investments differently. Wangari Waiga Stone. When I was with my bavu, looking at his avocado tree and the ocean. He counted one, two, three, trying to hold back fear. He counted four, five, six, breathing exercises his doctor gave him to keep his lungs seven, eight, nine from closing in, 10, one, two. Bavu, I said, teach me a Portuguese song. He could spread his lungs another way. He taught me the song of his childhood. I heard 90 years of his life in his voice, his earnestness as a young boy, Azar maj, azar maj, pela patria lutar. And when I squeezed and wrung the lyrics into English, the Portuguese national anthem was all about getting young boys to fight the British for the right to colonize Africa, to oust the monarchy, which was soon replaced by fascism, the long arm of war reaching into my grandfather's island in the middle of the sea. But he'd come to California and planted this avocado tree. So one more, <laughs> okay, uh, Tercera. I had no context for her story laughing till she cried. I'd never had a confidence like this and my house was quiet. I was barely 13 and she knowing she had cancer, Portuguese, uh, she knowing she had cancer placed a small lembranza. Portuguese for souvenir, memory, remembrance, reminder, keepsake, relic, happiness. This lembranza, a ceramic shoe, she pressed into my hand. It was from her honeymoon. It was like her islands, black, with flowers of yellow, pink, and blue. Gold writing on the tiny shoe said tercera, but I didn't know the language. I didn't even know it was an island. My avu could barely get the story out laughing so hard. She told me she said no to my grandfather, no to the bullfight. Only now I understand how hard it was to catch a husband and saying no on your honeymoon, especially to the bullfight in Tercera is never done, even now. No aspersions here. Now I know Tercera was the only place in all of Portugal to resist Spanish domination that in 1581, a woman, Brianda Pereira, in the Battle of Salga, rounded up all the bulls into a central caldera and let them loose to attack the Spanish Tercera has every reason to be proud of the bullfight, but lembranzas and saying no are keys to a better life. Her tiny shoe led me to the capital of this island with buildings like wedding cakes spilling with spring flowers. I held the lembranza in my hand, watching it grow, a seed becoming Azorian trees. The intimacy of women's stories, we are strong enough to say no, 
We are women who laugh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Elaine Avila. And with Elaine, we're going to end the conference, uh, the first day of it, that is. So the conference will continue for uh, a few more days until Thursday. I want to thank this wonderful panel. I want to thank them all. I know they're all very busy, and I know that they have um, lots of commitments, and uh, especially with their writing, because we want them to continue to write. I think all of you would agree with me. Um, and so, but I want to thank the, 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 this wave of creativity. As you can see, um, there's a distance. Some, of, uh, some folks are second generation, so there's thirds, so there's fourth, uh, but there is this connection um, uh, with, uh, with, with, with uh, the, Portuguese, um, the Portuguese culture, uh, with the Azorian culture, uh, most definite in this case as well. So I want to thank each and every one of you. I'm not gonna take any more time. I want to kind of end, uh, or I will end with this wonderful uh, quote here that I'm going to read from one of the postings, which is Professor Duarte Silva. Duarte is um, a, a professor emeritus from Stanford University, which lots of you know who he is. And Duarte follows lots of PVBI. He's been a mentor to PVBI in many, many ways and a, and a strong collaborator in many, many ways as well. And um, he wrote this that I'd like to share with you and thank you for your participation today and hope that all of you can join us tomorrow, Tuesday, starting at nine o'clock in the morning, uh, Pacific time. And just a word that it's a little bit different for Brazil, para os nossos colegas no Brasil, eu peço desculpa porque a hora mudou em Portugal, a hora mudou nos Estados Unidos, mas ainda não mudou no Brasil, portanto, em vez de quatro horas de diferença entre a Califórnia, estamos com cinco uh, this is uh, Duarte Silva's uh, uh, quote that I'm, uh, I'm reading. This has been such an enriching conference opening, uh, the conference opening, the history, the literature, the poetry, and so much more. Congratulations. Of course, congratulations is to all of you who participated. I'm going to switch back to Portuguese now. Muito obrigado a todos pela vossa participação. Até amanhã. Às 9 horas da manhã, no segundo dia, será neste mesmo formato, portanto, quem é, é o mesmo, a mesma ligação, um, e é, logo pela tarde, noite em Portugal e no Brasil, teremos todos os trabalhos de hoje já arquivados na nossa, no nosso canal do YouTube. Muito obrigado para todos e até amanhã. Obrigadíssimo. Obrigada. Boa tarde, boa noite, até boa. sempre.